Welcome to the Earth Feels Podcast. I'm Rose. And I'm Christine. Welcome to Earth Feels, the podcast for people feeling overwhelmed by the endlessly gloomy climate news. Where every week we have soul-based conversations about climate change and explore the idea that climate change may be happening for us as much as it is happening to us. If you are ready to shift your focus and secure the future for our kids and our grandkids, then this is the podcast for you. And yes, we do know how to spell. (laughs) This 200th episode of Earth Feels is entitled Post COP26, What Has to Happen for Us to Take Action on the Climate Crisis? As I edit this podcast for tomorrow's release, Cape Cod, Massachusetts is an unprecedented 64 degrees on November 18th of 2021. And you will hear Christine in British Columbia, Canada, is experiencing the equally unprecedented atmospheric river weather event. So Glasgow is done. Our so-called leaders have met and have taken incremental baby steps forward. But the climate crisis is not slowing down. It's here. What's it going to take? How much devastation? How many lives lost? Before we actually take action. So here we go. Hi, Rose. Hey, Christine. So obviously, you're feeling a lot of grief right now about what's going on in BC. Do you want to talk about it a little bit? Yeah, I think we should. So we always record a couple of days before the episode goes up. So we're recording this midweek. It's going to go up on Friday. So I don't know what will have changed or have happened by Friday. But this past weekend, Sunday and Monday, pretty much, there was this atmospheric river event, which I'm on Vancouver Island right now, uh, just to make it clear to our listeners in Victoria. So in BC in general, for the lower mainland of BC, there was this weather warning and also for, for the island. So we had lots of rain in Victoria, didn't impact us that much. We stayed home and we don't have any flooding, but even just right outside of Victoria in a kind of suburb. It's maybe 15 minutes down the road. Somebody we know showed us videos of his friend's house with six feet of water in the basement and also on the the main floor. So it's, it is impacting people here um, on Vancouver Island. There's uh, the main road up Island was washed out. I don't know if it's been restored, but Vancouver on the mainland has pretty much been cut off from the rest of Canada because there was so much mass of flooding that, uh, yeah, there's, there's no highway number one laugh. I mean, parts of it, like uh, we can put post videos that people are sharing. Like, I can't believe it. We drive that highway every time we, we come out here and there's huge, like, I don't know, quarter mile where it's just collapsed or it's been completely pushed into the river, like, and more than one place. And so there's a a community, a community of merit, about 7,000 people have had to be evacuated because of all all the flooding in their homes, but also it's overwhelmed their sewage treatment plant so that it's not safe to stay. And there's Indigenous people living in in communities, living in a specific valley. I don't know which one. There's so many in the interior that are cut off now completely. They have no road access. And so, and and people have died in the mudslides that closed. Yeah, so they were just driving between like, Hope and you know various uh, communities in, in the interior BC, and at least one person has been found dead because of these mudslides, which is another reason. So it's not just washouts; it's what mudslides. So, anyways, here we are. Climate change uh, impacts like this is unprecedented. Yes, we get rains and flooding uh, in BC every year, but just like the wildfires this summer, like it's just all getting so much more extreme. I was preparing for our podcast, listening, you know, and reading about COP26 and also seeing pictures of what's going on in BC. And I, when my husband got up, I said, you know, I feel like you need to go to the grocery store because there's a few things that we're short on. And I think there might be food shortages happening. He, he went, uh, wonderful man that he is, and, you know, just got us more 
flour and potatoes and onions and carrots. And, and I, I see somebody that used to live in Northern Ontario who's moved to Kamloops, which is in the interior. Now it hasn't been flooded out, but it's surrounded by communities that are. And she posted a picture of their grocery store and the only produce left was rutabagas. She said, I oh. guess nobody likes rutabagas. <laughs> I don't think I've ever eaten one, so I <laughs> yeah. wouldn't be my yes. cho- first choice. The poor lonely rutabaga. Apparently, even in an emergency, nobody wants to eat it. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, so it's happening. It's Mark said this story was fine here, and it might not happen here. And Vancouver Island is a little bit more self-sufficient. There's dairy farms, there's farmers, but it's just you know we talk about it, and we know that it's impacting people all around the world all the time, but it's not often quite this close. And I just look at that and I think, I mean, those poor people who are being impacted, I know what it's like to have to evacuate because of a fire, but not flooding and their homes are going to be devastated. And we have the infrastructure because we are a wealthy country to rebuild. We know that the people around the world who are being most impacted and who've contributed the least to it are those who often don't have the infrastructure in their uh, municipal, local, or, or federal level. So it's, yeah, I'm feeling sad. There was a statistic recently that talked about how in North America already there have been upwards of 3 million people who have been displaced by climate change. Now that can be fires, it could be the flooding like Katrina or or Sandy, and not to say that that it will be forever, but at least temporarily, um, upwards of 3 million people in the last five years or so. So we know it's coming. And to your point, we, as a wealthy nation, we've contributed to it. So we only have ourselves to blame. It's just going to exacerbate. It's just going to be more and more. It's just going to build. And going back to, you know, Mother Nature is speaking to us, Mother Gaia is speaking to us until, in my humble opinion, until the powers that be, and I don't want to be Debbie Downer about this, but until the powers that be are affected, it's status quo. And I think we've kind of seen that at COP26. The Pollyanna in me was very hopeful. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I I know what people would say, you know, well, what were you thinking? But the realist in me was not surprised. You know, I still want to focus on the possibility. And there was a lot of forward movement incremental forward movement. I mean, the first time they've ever said the word coal, ever said the word fossil fuel. Which is crazy in almost 30 years. I know. But John but John Kerry was quoted as saying that, yeah, this is the first time we've ever said these words. So can we take that as a victory? I'm I'm paraphrasing. Um, and, And yes, I think we need to look at that and go, okay, now we all know we're saying the words, but to Greta's point, blah, blah, blah. You know, yeah, where, yeah. where's the action? And have we pushed out to COP27 in Egypt? Yes. In prepping for our chat today, I've been reading, you know, a wide variety of opinions. So yes to both. Yes, to John Kerry's point. They're actually talking about fossil fuels now, although I read that it had the lead negotiator, the host from the the UK, so not Boris Johnson. Not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, but Alok Sharma was representing the UK there at the the table at the end with the negotiation, was in tears because of India insisting Mm -hmm. uh, that it's... That what what was it the the nuance there instead of phasing out coal they're phasing down coal phasing down coal yeah so yeah is it enough absolutely not and climate tracker has a really good article that shows exactly how much not enough it is but I also would go to an article from David Roberts he oh and the and from Volt for Grist. his newsletter is called Volt yeah right and but this was posted on Canary Media which is part of Canary Media yeah yeah okay. if you if you're like not like Canary in uh, the coal mine yeah it, exactly and it is it's this institute in Colorado Amory Levins Institute that's been leading on renewable uh, thinking since the 80s and so Canary Media is associated with Amory and Hunter Lovins' organization. So he said, yes, it's not enough. 
And yes, we should also know that movement was made. And uh, he talked about the fact that there's actually two climate events during COP. Did you hear any breakdown about that? Well, there's the event that's going on inside with the negotiations. And then there's kind of like a, almost like a convention where people are like selling solutions and it's a money-making event. Well, and it's, then there's three events because there's the protesters outside that are yes. doing something completely, I mean, making their voices heard, thankfully that they're there and keeping the pressure on. They're completely a different group than the negotiators inside. Yes, exactly. And we all know, we've probably heard, our listeners are probably aware that the, so not in the negotiating tables, that's only the 198 countries, you know, in those, that kind of interior part of COP26, the actual UN negotiations. But outside of that, which they still call COP26, kind of that conference, we all know that the fossil fuel industry was. More delegates from the fossil fuel industry than from any country. Yeah. Yeah. So why are they even allowed to be there? I mean, but they have for 26 years and and all of a sudden we're hearing about it now. So it's the spotlight is on them. And Mm -hmm. I I think I mean, the end is in sight. Right. So David Roberts pointed out that fingers crossed the end is in sight. (laughs) Did you see today that there's a huge lease auction? I think it's in in the Gulf of Mexico for oil leases. It's federal. Trump had put it on the agenda. Biden tried to roll it back. And some, I don't know if it's Fifth Circuit judge, Third Circuit judge or whatever, overruled and said that this auction has to go forward. They'll have to do exploration and it would it would be 10 years before they would actually be able to drill anything or whatever. But what the actual F are we thinking? We just got off of COP26. We know it is 1.5 even on the table. Now they're talking no. 1.7 or 2.0. That's a great, folks. That's not Fahrenheit. Well, so, but I like the way he framed it. He said, remember, whatever agreements were made between those 198 countries and the uh, sort of UNFCCC part, that core part, are not binding. He said it was the usual incremental slow movement forward and India's phase down instead of phase out of of, uh, coal coal was disappointing. But he he again says, keep in mind, this is the first time fossil fuels have ever been mentioned in a COP agreement. And he said, what people seem to forget is the UNFCCC has no real power to enforce anything And there just isn't the level of unity uh, required to have a binding target with real consequences. So So it's basically diplomacy and peer pressure. But he also says in Climate Track, we're going to put a link to this article. A decade ago, we were on track for four to six degrees Celsius average warming by the end of the century. So now we are bending the curve. We are. And we've brought that four to six down to 2.7, which, as you said, not acceptable. 2.7 or 2.0? 2.7, which would still be devastating. But he writes, we're not going to stop there. Progress is only accelerating. If every country that has submitted a 2030 carbon target in the Paris process, a nationally determined contribution, they're called, or NDC, hits it, the average warming will be 2.4 degrees Celsius. This is all based on climate tracker information. If all short and long-term targets submitted thus far are achieved, and there's a big question mark, Canada has never achieved its target. I'm just saying, so Mm -hmm. uh, shame Mm -hmm. on us. And I don't know many other countries who have, but if they are achieved, it's down to 2.1 2.1 degrees Celsius. That's in Climate Action Tracker's optimistic s- scenario, the most optimistic one that they put out, in which all targets announced by everyone anywhere are met. The <laughs> average is down to 1.8 degrees Celsius. Where are we now, though? Aren't we at 1.1 already? Oh, yeah, that's built in. But Climate Action Tracker says if every, you know, so that's the most optimistic. Mm-hmm. So, which is still higher than 1.5. And I think that we have to include 
information that Project Drawdown has, which says that we can draw carbon out of the atmosphere and not with technology, not we don't need new technology. There's like trees. There's there's like that's the kind of the uh, the biggest technology in quotation marks. So, and on the other hand, I read an article by Peter Kalmus, who's a climate scientist, and I follow him on Twitter. And he's like, Glasgow was a disaster. I think we have to hold those two truths. Glasgow was a disaster for the climate, and also Glasgow made progress. And ultimately, don't you think it's not progress is not going to happen at those negotiating tables? It's the people, the young people on the street demanding action. It's the developing nation saying that's not good enough. That's our death sentence. From my perspective, and I, I just have to say, I loved your conversation that you shared last Friday's episode with the five of you uh, women talking about um, sort of becoming Mother Earth's boots on boots the, on ground. the ground. And that idea, all of them kind of talked about tapping into Mother Earth, what she's telling us. And again, I, I bring this up a lot. There's a, a level that's above the negotiation. That's a consciousness shift that that mm-hmm. is working as well. And mm-hmm. so I do so the believe push that. from below, the push from above, and the last place we're going to uh, finally, you know, it see is, it is in the negotiation rooms. It, exactly. Yeah. And there is progress being made there. Yeah. Even so, I guess I was, I mean, I'm still devastated this morning. I was reading all the cop stuff and I was seeing this devastation in, you know, not quite in my backyard, but pretty close to home. And I know people in the interior who are impacted by it. And I mean, the fact that rails are affected, so you can't put stuff on rails. So, or, or truck, there might be highway three in the very South, which I'm pretty sure had mudslides, but didn't necessarily get washed out to the extent that the other ones is. So there, there may be one road that connects the West coast to the rest of Canada. So I didn't look at the news this morning. When I first wake up, I kind of doom scroll for about the first half hour, but I didn't, I look at the New York Times and the Washington Post. So I can tell you that that story was not, Atmospheric River was not in today's paper or into on today's mainstream media in the US, US. in the US. So uh, the big story here continues to be um, supply chain and how Christmas isn't going to be what we want it to be. The media, I I don't, I, I feel like, there's certain outlets like The Guardian, The Nation. I posted an article on Monday from this environmental news journal called The Revelator. I feel like it's we have to go to smaller, almost in well, The Guardian and The Nation aren't smaller, but we have, but they're they're mm-hmm. not mainstream. They're not mainstream media. The media isn't doing a good job of telling us what's actually happening. They're the realist in me knows that. They've always put a slant on it, but they need to be covering the reality of what is happening right now. Because again, until we all feel it, people just kind of turn the other way. I mean, even in my little enclave here on Cape Cod, we had power outage for four days because of high winds. This was a couple of weeks ago. It was over Halloween weekend, but there were thousands of people that were out of power. And I know, I don't have a generator. I know it's only going to get worse. We know it's only going to get worse. So how do we prepare for it? I mean, even even if the media was covering adaptation, but they're not. They're really mired in this divisiveness and this poverty mentality, this scarcity that they want us to stay afraid of what? That we won't have the right color shoes underneath our Christmas tree? I think there is responsibility there that's being abdicated. I'm kind of shocked. I'm kind of shocked that I didn't know. I mean, like I said to you yesterday, I talked to some friends up in, in the Pacific Northwest in the Seattle area, and I know that they were talking about rains there and the flooding there. Um, one of the women lives in the Skagit Valley, which is like the tulip capital um, in of the states in Wash in in Washington State. That everything there was underwater, and her husband couldn't get home from work. He had to take this circuitous route and all this kind of stuff. But I think it needs to be front and forward until we see every single day on mainstream media, this is the climate event that happened today. This is the climate event that happened today. 
how do we, do we just not get it? Sorry, I'm going to continue on my soapbox here. To your point from earlier, until it comes from people in the streets, and we can't be leaving it just to our youth. We all have to be like, this cannot stand. This cannot stand. We have to change this. Yeah. Well, I would, I guess I'm less of an optimist than you are in that. Well, you've been in it longer. Well, I have no expectation that the media is going to lead on this kind of like, I don't expect the government negotiators uh, to lead on this. They're in it. It's, it's for profit. And, and as a Canadian, I can tell you, the U S almost never covers Canadian news. Oh, so. of course. <laughs> we don't cover anything. We, we cover celebrities. That's what we cover. So I'm less, I'm less shocked, uh, but it's a very big news here. And I uh-huh. think it's interesting that it's come right on the heels of disappointment at COP. I'll share a friend of the show, Kim, who lives in Northwestern Ontario and who's very concerned about climate change and very proactive in so many ways, wrote a letter to our Minister of Climate Change and Environment, our new one, congratulating him on his post and wanting to know what he's going to do, actually do about it now, but also to our member of parliament for, so that's federal, uh, who's a conservative. Uh, So conservatives in Canada, like in the US, have not been proactive on climate change. But this guy is young. He's like, I don't know, is he even 25 now? Maybe he's 24. Super young. And he got reelected in the recent election. So she wrote him a uh, note congratulating him and asking if when he was available to talk about climate change, because she's very concerned about it. And he got back to her and she's going to talk to him in the next week or two. So I guess that we need to keep at our politicians because it's a changing, it's a moving target. And I think, especially the younger politicians, even though their parties may not have been very progressive on this, they may be more open to it. And also it's freaking expensive and conservatives of all kinds should be appalled. If you're fiscally responsible, even the military industrial complex says that this is the biggest threat to the security of our nations. Yeah. So yeah, what does it take for the light switch to go think? It's on now. They're actually looking at what's happening. What does it take for the light bulb to go on? more devastation. Mm -hmm. In university, when I was doing my religious studies degree, I had this wonderful religious studies prof, Carl Ridd, who is no longer here on with us on the planet, but a wonderful, wonderful guy. He was so kind of critiquing the military industrial complex back then. And he used to say, so I'm old enough that I was, it was in the eighties, possibly the early eighties that I was at university. He was talking about, so that was before there was that agreement that came about because of Gorbachev around nuclear weapons. So we were, you know, nuclear weapons were a really big deal. The Mm -hmm. most, the biggest threat almost like climate change in that it was so we were all so vulnerable and it felt like we couldn't do anything. Anyways, he used to say it's going to take a bomb going off in Idaho to make change because it has to affect Americans because you were part of the arms race has to affect them. So I would say the good news is it didn't actually take a nuclear bomb going off in Idaho to bring about this global agreement on nuclear weapons. Now, nuclear weapons are still a threat, but it made a huge difference, the steps that were made in the 80s. So I guess the good news, in quotation marks, is that it's starting to impact people in Idaho and in British Columbia. And like the farmers are devastated in your in the Midwest. The fact that the whole West Coast, I mean, from Seattle and Portland down through California, And we've been talking about California fires for years, but Mm -hmm. that's a huge population that you don't have runaway wildfires in an area of the country where it's raining all the time. You just don't. So it's happening everywhere. It's happening everywhere. The flooding in New York a number of years ago where all the subways were flooded and stuff. I just saw pictures the other day of Venice, which I know has been underwater for a long time. We were there. My husband's 50th birthday which uh, how many years ago was that? 15 years ago. And during king tides, it was underwater. Well, now it's like underwater all the time. 
what does it take for people to say, I really don't want to live like this. And how much worse is it going to get for my kids and my grandkids? Well, we've got a decade. We've got less than a decade. Less than a decade. We're coming up in 2022. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Hmm. here we are. I guess I would say to listeners, you know, read about COP26 if you want and know that not enough was done. And at the same time, progress was made. And it's really up to us, whatever level we we can locally and and up uh-huh. energetically, which is what I do. I'm working with more and more people at that level. Going back to the panel at, for the Parliament of World Religions, where we were talking about listening to Mother, listening to Gaia, essentially, and becoming her boots on the ground. I do believe, and I stated this on the panel, I do believe that we're all hearing her. We're all hearing her. We all have the ability to hear her. Maybe I should say it that way. If we're quiet enough, if we listen, if we don't distract ourselves with all the distractions that we have, right? If you get to the point where you're quiet enough, if you take a walk in the woods, if you sit at the ocean by yourself, she's speaking to us every day. I mean, the fact that this is juxtaposed to COP26, I mean, in my mind, there is no Mm -hmm. such thing as random. Mm -hmm. COP26 was a failure. Okay, let me show you what's happening. She's saying, this is where we're going. Why aren't we listening? And I do believe that the panel of the five of us, well, I know that obviously you're one of those people too. There's there's thousands and thousands of us that hear her voice on a daily basis and know what she's saying. We all need to be doing our part. We all need to be listening. I would go back to that statement from David Hawkins that it's very, very recent in human evolution and the evolution on this planet that we care about people outside of our circle and about Mm. uh, the environment. This is radical evolutionary steps that we're talking. And it seems obvious. Of course we would do that. But apparently, you know, not everybody's there yet. And that's how it works. So we yeah. just have to keep doing our work and uh, not knowing, not knowing uh, what the outcome is. And that isn't important at this time. It, we just keep, keep on doing our work and taking comfort in connecting with other people who are doing uh, this work. So, yeah, I think that's a good place to end. Okay. So good news. Any good news? Uh, yes. At COP26, the, not the UNFCC part, but uh, again, it's, it doesn't include 196 countries because there's tre- other treaties were brokered during that uh, process, basically with coalitions of the willing, which isn't all 196 or 198. Um, so there was a global tre- treaty on methane yep. uh, brokered by the US and the UK, which has been signed by more than 100 countries. A group of renewable energy players created the 24-7 Carbon Free Energy Compact in partnership with Sustainable Energy for All and UN Energy. So I think that's a good thing. A group of governments and private funders pledged to spend a total of $1.7 billion on Indigenous people and local communities to protect local biodiversity and over 100 countries pledged to stop deforestation by 2030. I think you might have mentioned that already. And there's more. So as an action step, focus on the good and keep pushing that. Write your legislators, go to protests, do what you can. On social media, spread the word. Use your voice, use your voice, use your voice. It is our superpower, as Harriet would say. Harriet Sugar. That's one of our superpowers, using our voice and where we spend our dollars. Think about as we go into this holiday season, buy sustainable. If you want to give, give memory-making events, not stuff. An action step might be in light of what's going on in BC right now. And just as a reminder, think about resiliency and connect with uh, your community because you're going to need each other in the the times uh, ahead. We need to depend on People not only online, but in our own community. So is that an action step or a sanity tip? Well, I think it can be both because it's good for one's mental health to feel connected. All right. Okay. Thanks, Rose. Thanks, everybody, for listening. That's this week's Friday episode of Earth Feels. Special thanks to singer-songwriter Kristen Hoffman 
for generously allowing us to use song for the ocean. Thanks for listening. Don't forget, subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss an episode. Catch you next time. Bye-bye. Children of the earth, I'm calling out. There's a mission for you and for me.